We've got a tornado spotted approximately one mile east of Ellerslie. Hello? Hi. Oh, I'm all alone and I think there's going to be something happening, a hurricane or something. I don't know what to do. I'm in my basement. I don't know what to do and I don't want to die. Police. Police. Yep. Okay, we're in the Clearview area yep. and have been hit by their tornado. There's houses that are completely flattened in the area. Our roof is off. Your roof is off? Yeah, it's gone. God almighty, would you please help me? July 31st, 1987. At roughly 3.15 p.m., a tornado touches down in Edmonton's southeast corner and begins a devastating march north, demolishing homes, businesses, vehicles, and power lines. It will take roughly 45 minutes before the winds die down. It is the nation's worst natural disaster. In the next half hour, a look back at what took place in the first few days of the catastrophe. touches down in the residential area of Mill Woods. Damage is severe, but miraculously, there are no serious injuries or death. The tornado marches north. It builds in intensity as it rips through an industrial area east of Edmonton. Police, fire, and ambulance crews are literally swamped with calls. Almost everywhere they look, there is someone needing help. People trapped in cars, buried under tons of rubble, injured needing treatment, and the dead. The first priority is to find survivors and rush victims to hospital. There aren't nearly enough ambulances. The wounded are transported by whatever vehicles are available. 2-Charlie 6-8 to control. 2-Charlie 6-8. Right, I'm at 68 Avenue and about 30 Street, there's a house torn all to hell here. I'm going to go and see if I can find anybody. There's dead animals and everything around here. Also, there's uh, two trees down on the power lines along 34th Street. I would suggest that we better shut off 34th Street from between uh, 34th, uh, between the Point Buck Freeway and North, please. Hey, and we've got a report of uh, one person 10 2 in front of Byers uh, Transport. We're going to go check it out. Yeah, I don't think there's too much you can do here. Why don't we go back? 2 Charlie 6 8 to control. 2 Charlie 6 8. I know this may sound stupid, but you better get a hold of the uh, disaster services or whoever can help us in this. We're going to need all the help we can get out here. The city of Edmonton does, in fact, implement its disaster plan. The heads of each city department assemble in a conference room in City Hall, which becomes the Emergency Operations Center. The mayor, police and fire chiefs, the head of the ambulance service, representatives of Edmonton Power, Edmonton Telephones, Edmonton Transit, Northwestern Utilities, Social Services, Alberta Disaster Services. I declared a state of local emergency, which allows the city to uh, invoke uh, certain powers demolish buildings uh, and that's needed because people have been trapped in buildings and there are still people trapped. The fire department uh, responded in full and we had in excess of 400 people in about an hour and a half after this started which is very commendable for our people I believe. We called in all our employees, all those who were available were called upon. 
All our vehicles were utilized. We also called upon Edmonton Transport for some, uh, uh, for some buses. We have used private vehicles. And we've had a large number of volunteers, people like paramedics from outside the city who phoned in and volunteered and come through the area. Our people on the south side are having considerable trouble getting into these buildings. We have heavy equipment going in there. The buildings will, be ha will have to be taken apart one by one and uh, searched uh, individually. The rescue operation is being coordinated from here. Calls of trouble keep pouring in. I'm calling with, I work with Laidlaw Waste. Uh, the tornado went over top of us and leveled our shop and there's people in there. The majority of resources are being sent to the industrial park, but the tornado is not yet finished. The funnel continues its trek north, heading into the Clareview area. It is now 3.40 p.m. 12 people are already dead. Winds reach 417 kilometers an hour. 463 houses will be damaged. Some are flattened. No feeling. This, just blank. Don't know what to do. Don't know what we're going to do next. The terror moves further north to the Evergreen Trailer Park. There are 723 mobile homes here. 208 are damaged. 126 totally demolished. All our services here were cut off. The smell of gas in the air was terrible, so we knew gas lines were ruptured. What we wanted in here was for the outside world to know what was going on and that we needed help desperately. Rescue operations are delayed. The tornado has wiped out the phone exchange. The call for help comes from the Alberta Hospital, two kilometers away. We're at the Alberta Hospital now. Yeah. There's two people in emergency here. The tornado went right through Evergreen Park. Yeah. It's torn up trailers and people everywhere. The first rescue personnel to arrive are faced with massive damage. The dead and dying appear to be everywhere. More than 100 people are injured. There was massive flooding. Bravo 9 control. Bravo 9. Power line is down here and it's a hell of a mess. Uh, we need lots of help. Bravo 9 control. Bravo 9. We need a 10 16 here urgently. We've got a girl dying. Do you have any medical problems? No. You're pretty cold, aren't you? Okay. Do you want to get see if you can get a blood pressure on her? Okay, please. Your arm? Okay, dear. I think I may be cold. Just keep it. What it reminded me of is a, a jet fighter warming up before afterburner hits. And then when the funnel is right close to you, that's that's the afterburner. It comes in like a woo and then bang. And you know it's either over top of you or beside you. City emergency crews take one call after another. Down power lines, demolished buildings, leaking gas, people trapped. In a normal situation, each would be considered a major event and command immediate attention. Today, every nightmare is a reality. My name is Cliff Johnstone, terminal superintendent for CN Rail. Uh -huh. I have a train derailment. I do have special dangerous commodities on the train, and it would appear our train has been hit by a funnel cloud. We do have anhydrous ammonia, sulfuric acid, and other special dangerous commodities involved. Some of the more critically injured are rushed from the scene by helicopter. The medivacs land at Edmonton's Municipal Airport, where waiting ambulances take the patients. From here, it is only a few minutes' ride to hospital. Almost every Edmonton hospital enacts its own disaster plans. Off-duty nurses and doctors are called in. Those here stay at their posts long after their shift ends. Volunteers from every area of the hospital come to the emergency department to help out. And the patients, horror stories. When it started to hit uh, the o doorman, the guy, the owner, he got underneath this boat. So we, me and my fiance were there. We both got underneath there too. And uh, next thing we knew, the wind was blowing like crazy, and, and the boat was rocking. It was being pulled a little bit, but uh, it didn't fly away. Luckily, uh, then when when it was all over, we looked around, and there was just rubble everywhere. There was just nothing left. I was just sitting down reading uh, some mail. And I felt the wind going through my house that so fast that my ears were popping. And then I got up to look outside, and I could see, I could see the all the buildings on our property, which are about seven, eight, all being torn down. And I watched a van roll on the road in front of us, and I just went through the window with the rest of the house when it collapsed, and I just kept rolling. I got hit with uh, half the house. 
power was knocked out, so we were outside watching you come in. We didn't think what, what it was going to be like, eh? And so we went inside when it got closer, just leveled the whole building, whole street, leveled the whole block. I got cut in the head and back of the head and racked up shoulder, that's about it. Everybody else in our shop was okay. They were buried for, what, a half an hour. Most people couldn't believe that a tornado touched down here. In the United States, sure, but not here in Edmonton. Well, the fact is, while damage on this scale is unprecedented, tornadoes do touch down in Alberta every year. Between 1960 and 1982, there was an average of 8.3 tornado sightings in Alberta every year. In the last four years, tornado activity has ranged from a low of 12 sightings to a high of 21 in 1986. The funnel clouds have kept to rural areas damage minimal. On July 31st, 1987, that changed. This one had to get a tornado over there. Ooh, man. It's going to do some damage. The one thing we do know about tornadoes is that they are always formed from thunderstorms. If you haven't got a thunderstorm, you don't get a tornado. But only 2% of the 150,000 thunderstorms that we get in Canada and the United States every year, only 2% of those are spawning tornadoes. And they want to know the reasons why. First of all, there are two theories. There's the thermal theory. Here we have a nice summer day. It's hot on the ground, and the air above is cold. Okay, what happens is that the warm air starts to rise, hits the cold air, and then it starts to build a thunderhead. And after the thunderhead is built, within that thunderhead you get a vortex because as that air is rising, it is giving off heat. Heat in the form of condensation around there, that punches it up even more until you get one of those towering cumulus clouds and you get that enormous vortex all the way in through there. Then it hits the upper winds aloft, as we had over here uh, on, the, on that fateful July the 31st. And that created a vortex which like, works all the way down through the storm, right down to the ground, and then you got a tornado. That's the first theory. The second theory is the mechanical theory. Simply this, that once you get the tornado going, once you get a little bit of movement in that cloud, you have the cooler air coming in and compressing it. Now, when it compresses it, it forces it to get uh, faster and faster, much like the skater that we've heard about with her arms out here, and then she turns and turns, and she gets spinning faster and faster and faster, till once she gets her arm in through here, she's just a blur. That's what they say happens here. Well, what was the situation in Edmonton on that fateful day? Well, I'll tell you. There was a low-pressure area here. That low pressure area had been bringing in all kinds of warm, moist air for days and just dumping it all over through here. And then there was a, a upper cold front came through from the Pacific and the collision of that warm, moist air, the upper cold front ticked it off. Now, whether it was mechanical or thermal doesn't matter. All that we know is that it generated one of the most, uh, one of the worst tornadoes that this country has ever seen. Another thing about tornadoes, they don't seem to like high buildings. They always seem to go with sort of a malicious intent to wherever the buildings are low. And, uh, and probably because they do not want to shut off the fuel, the warm air, and that causes these to be the most destructive features on any weather map at all. Tornadoes are rated using the Fujita intensity scale. Winds can reach as high as 509 kilometers per hour. Enough strength to lift and move tons of concrete to throw vehicles about like toys, to demolish even the toughest of buildings. The Edmonton Tornado rated as high as F4. Stay clear where you can get out if you have to, but be accessible. The first hour after the tornado hit can best be described as chaotic. Emergency personnel overwhelmed by the unfolding tragedy. 2 Charlie 6 8 to control. 2 Charlie 6 8. I have several buildings down here with people trapped under cement and everything else. Get me as much help as you can to uh, 64 Avenue and 27, 28th Street, please. To Charlie 6-8 was Police Sergeant Ron Madej. It was uh, chaos, panic, uh, like nothing I've ever seen before, and hopefully nothing I'll ever see again. To tell you the truth, it didn't really sink into me until after I was relieved of my duties, which was uh, after a 24-hour shift, and I got home and I was able to relax, and that's when reality really hit me. When I walked in the house, my uh, wife met me at the door, and the uh, first thing she asked me if I was okay. And uh, then she asked me if I wanted to uh, have breakfast. And I said, uh, no. So I walked over and I poured myself a large drink. I had one drink, and uh, I started talking to the wife, and I came about uh, that far from crying. 2 Charlie 7, control. 
Charlie 7 was police constable Mike Cook. We put up with 30 below zero weather. We don't put up with raging winds like that. And it's almost disbelief. Uh, deep down, I know it was there. I know I was there. But I didn't believe that it, it had actually happened. You didn't really have time to stand there and, and look around at the destruction and to really assess it. You just had to go in and uh, do what you could for the people that were coming out of the rubble. As time passes, the emergency plan begins to bring order to the rescue operation. Gas and power lines are shut off. Evergreen Trailer Park is sealed to all but emergency crews. Frustrating for those seeking word on family or friends. So all we're asking is that you stay here, leave your vehicles here, just leave yourselves here, because the more people we got there, the more people we get in the way. And we don't need that. On the radio on the way here, they said there's 70 trailers right out of the place now. And now they say there's a major gas leak and there's ambulances going through here by the dozens and we don't know nothing. And you got family in there? I don't even know if my mom and dad's alive. <laughs> Inside the trailer park, the hunt for those trapped in rubble continues. Many residents stumble about in shock. 1,700 people are to be evacuated. We were in lot 71 and the trailer is flat. I walked past the place and the only thing I could find was my wife's Bible. Her trailer was the second from the road and there's nothing there, nothing. In the industrial area, a massive rescue operation continues. And you're responsible for going through the whole building and all their property. And once that's done, you come on and identify it to us. Okay. And then that building's secure. Okay. okay. We'll take five policemen. And five volunteers. Searching the buildings is hampered by leaking chemicals and, of course, the tons of debris. As daylight fades, the hunt for survivors is complicated further. This was the scene at the North Lumber Yard. Huge movie lights brought in by a local television station illuminate a search area. A concrete roof weighing 300 tons was picked up and moved 75 feet. The owner of the lumber yard is buried underneath. Brick by brick, firemen, police, and volunteers work their way through the rubble. It is a frantic race against time. The longer it takes to find those buried, the more likely they will be found dead. Back at Evergreen, hundreds of volunteers continue to hunt for victims. A contingent of militia members searches through the remains of trailer. Hello, is anyone home? Kids calling her mattresses and shit. Eh? Never know. Every possible disaster services is out here. There are police, the fire Edmonton Fire Department, there are ambulance services from not only Edmonton but surrounding communities. The militia, the Air Force, they have volunteered to help search. Uh, everyone is out here. <laughs> The Red Cross has set up emergency relief centers, but victims have turned to family or friends. There are more volunteers here than those in need. The turnout has been marvelous. People are lined up offering to help, and the phone calls have just, you know, almost overwhelmed us for the amount of services that people are willing to offer. By daybreak Saturday, the search and rescue operation is slowly winding down. By Saturday afternoon, roughly 24 hours after the tornado hit, the emergency crews believe everyone is accounted for. The city's emergency operations center at City Hall begins to relinquish responsibility for the cleanup. A site manager is appointed to coordinate activities with individual site commanders. One of their first jobs is to deal with sightseers. The damaged areas have become the biggest attraction in town. Well, they don't want anybody down here unless they're living right on the block here. They keep everybody out. Oh, we just came around the back. Yeah, no, but the police are down there now. They're kicking everybody up there. There is also a fear of looting. The patience of victims is wearing thin. By Sunday, there was already talk of rebuilding. Residents of the trailer park are allowed to return to what remains of their homes to search for valuables. Oh, my God. Oh, 
There is not much left for many, and for some, nothing at all. In the rush to clear debris, the worst hit homes have been bulldozed, loaded onto trucks, and sent to the dump. And some of the ones who are still possibly in a state of shock and don't have family and friends behind them, don't even know that they can come in and get some of their stuff. They're given a half an hour to come in on a bus, pick up whatever they can, and go back out. Half an hour isn't even enough to move stuff, to find anything. While tempers flare briefly, aid floods into relief centers. Mountains of clothing, food, furniture. The outpouring by people across North America is as overwhelming as the disaster. Within days, organizers say they have too much. Hundreds of volunteers will spend months sorting through it all. But even without this and promised government aid, those touched by the tornado remain thankful just to be alive. I looked out the window and it was everything was flying. The, you, I couldn't see the tornado, but the wind was carrying everything. And I just, I grabbed the Bible and I just sat and I prayed to God to help me. And he did. He, he helped me. I'm so thankful. A massive report on how the city responded to this tragedy has been prepared. It details countless stories of bravery. Much of the initial medical care and searching was carried out by volunteers. Passing motorists would stop, pick up injured, rush them to hospital, and then drive away. If any one conclusion can be reached, it's that no one could ever plan for a disaster on this scale. And despite the inevitable mistakes, overall, we're told, the city reacted well. Final damage estimates indicate the tornado destroyed $2.5 million worth of property in Mill Woods, more than $250 million damage in the industrial park, roughly $8 million damage in Clareview, and an equal amount in the Evergreen Mobile Home Park. Hundreds of people were injured, 27 were killed, men, women, and children.